Hi! In this video, we'll continue reading Peak by Roland Smith, beginning with chapter 20. Um, just as a quick reminder of the events from the last video, Zopa revealed to Peak, Josh, Holly, and the film crew that he is Sanjo's grandfather. Um, Sanjo is also six days older than Peak, and um, he plans to summit Everest with them. And this is big, big news because this would make Sanjo the youngest free Tibetan to summit Everest, um, which could give him enough money, um, the notoriety he gets from that could give him enough money to go back to school and then never have to be a Sherpa or a porter or have to climb the mountain um, for money at all. Um, but they also need to keep the secret um, because if the Chinese soldiers were to find out, they would likely imprison um, Sanjo because they don't want anyone from Tibet to be um, the youngest climber. Sanjo also had to fake his papers in order to get on the mountain, so that would be another problem. Um, and then they also need to keep their summit attempt a secret from the Chinese soldiers for a second reason, because Peak will be the youngest person ever to climb Everest and of course that's a matter of national pride and the Chinese would want probably a Chinese person to be that first uh, the youngest person um, so they would they would put the they would end the operation if they had found out so there's a lot of secrets being kept here um, so they have a plan they're going to send all the people going to the summit up in three climbing groups and group C which is the the group that Peak, Sunjo, Holly, and the film crew and Zopa are going up in. Um, no one knows that they are actually going to try for the summit, and so no one will know until they reach the summit. So that's their plan right now. Um, in 20, chapter 20, we'll pick up where we left off. Chapter 20, Camp 4. Zopa roused Holly and me out of our tents at sunrise. Another beautiful day. Clear, crisp, 22 degrees and rising, which meant we'd have to pack our cold weather gear on our backs instead of wearing it. To make things worse, Zopa gave, gave each of us a pile of Sunjo's gear to haul up to the first camp. Holly's share was a lot smaller than my share. She finished repacking quickly and left for the mess tent. It took me 45 minutes to reorganize what I'd packed the night before. I was slowed down by my, my ill feelings towards Sunjo and Zopa. I couldn't believe it. Not only had Zopa taken my gear and given it to Sanjo, but now I had to haul it up the mountain for him. It seemed that he was doing everything in his power to make sure I was too weak to get to the top. When I finally finished, my pack was 15 pounds heavier than it was for my first time up to ABC. Not good. One pound can make a huge difference at this altitude. I was trying to decide what to leave behind when Captain Sheck walked up. You try for summit? he demanded. He was out of uniform, dressed like a climber, which is probably why I didn't notice him sneaking up on me. Not today, I said. How old are you? He must have been watching and had waited to catch me alone like this. How old are you? He repeated aggressively. Trick question. He'd seen my passport. He knew exactly how old I was. He wanted me to lie. I told him the truth. Where other boy? Uh-oh. Who? I'm a terrible liar. Boy, you climbed mountain with last week. Boy you walk with in camp. You and he good friends. Captain Sheck's English was a little rough, but the but the sarcasm was crystal clear. He had watched us walking around camp. He had seen us head up the mountain to ABC. Oh, him, I said stupidly. I haven't seen him in a couple of days. Where'd he go? I shrugged. You lying to me. Apparently I couldn't even shrug a lie. I kick you off mountain if you lie. Go ahead, I said, zipping my pack closed. Probably not the brightest thing to say, but I had had about enough of Captain Sheck and everything else on Everest. He looked like he was about to explode. I don't think he was used to having a 14-year-old call his bluff. He raised his arm, and for a second I thought he was going to hit me, but then he smiled as if he realized the... I'm sorry. But then he smiled as if he realized the this is the People's Republic of China, you have no rights thing wasn't going to work on me. What is other boy's name? he asked in much more reasonable tone. He didn't say, I picked up my pack. I'm watching you. I walked away, feeling his eyes drilling, drilling into the back of my neck, proud of myself for not even thinking about ratting out Sanjo. As soon as I found Zopa, I told him about the conversation. He was a lot calmer about it than I was, saying that Captain Sheck was the least of our problems. 
In a few days you will be at Camp 4, he said. This is all you need to worry about. It turned out that he was right. We joined a small group of porters in their yaks heading up the mountain. Sunjo was not with them. When I asked Zopa about this, he said, He'll be along. The trip up to intermediate camp was a lot easier than the first time. I wasn't able to sing and chant with the porters, but I was able to talk as I walked, which was a big improvement. I even managed to use the tiny video camera and discovered that I was a lot more comfortable behind it than I was in front of it. The landscape had changed dramatically from the previous week. The warm weather had created several new streams of glacial runoff. It was difficult to find places to cross without drenching ourselves. The other problem was the rocks. The thaw was causing them to pop loose from the ice. It was like the glacier was a bowling lane and we were the pins. One of the porters and his yacht got hit by a large rock and had returned to base camp. Did you get the strike on tape? Jack asked. Uh, no. He swore. I spent most of the trip with Holly, who wasn't doing that well. I think because she was carrying her own pack. I offered to lug it for a while, but she insisted on carrying it herself, for which I was relieved. She said she was thinking about heading home after we got down from Camp 4 and wanted to know if I would give her an exclusive interview after I got down from the summit. You're going to quit? Reaching the summit of Everest was not on my to-do list this year. If it had been, I might have done some practice climbs and visited the gym a little more leading up to this. Or maybe even climbed a skyscraper or two. She grinned and pointed at the peak. The clouds had cleared enough for us to see the, top, the very top. I don't know if you've noticed, but that's one of the most daunting sights on Earth. You don't strike me as easily daunted. Yeah, well... She took a deep breath. I've learned a couple things about myself up here. One, I'm getting older. And two, she took another deep breath. This mountain is a lot bigger than I am. It's humbling. The truth is, I've had some time to do some thinking. I can't tell you how long it's been since I've been alone. That's been humbling, too. Pierre and Ralph taking off was probably the best thing that ever happened to me. Being in a camp with over 300 people is not exactly being alone. But I knew what she meant. You don't have to be alone to feel alone. What about that interview? She asked again. I'd been doing some thinking, too. We'll see, I said. I could tell that Holly wanted to argue, but she was too out of breath to pursue it. She and I straggled into camp after everyone else, and we were both surprised to see Sunjo sitting on a rock with a cup of hot tea in his hands, looking a little rumpled in his porter clothes. When did you get here? A half hour ago. You left ahead of us? No, he said. I left the same time that you left. I thought he was pulling my leg. There had been a dozen or so porters and maybe half that number of yaks. I couldn't have missed him. I rode on Gulu's yak. Yeah, right, I said, when you were a baby. I had walked with Gulu some on the way up. The only thing I'd seen on his yak's back was a pile of hay. No, Sunjo insisted. I was concealed beneath the hay. You're kidding? He shook his head. It's hot. It was hot and uncomfortable. I told him about Captain Sheck. A worried look crossed his face. That means I'll have to go up the mountain again on the yak. I'm not looking forward to that. Thank you for carrying my things up here. I wished he wasn't always so polite. It would be easier to be mad at him. No problem, he said, and realized that the extra weight hadn't been a problem. That was encouraging. I looked around camp. It had not improved in the past week. The boulder belching slope looked even more unstable than the last time we had been up here. Zopo was looking at the slope too, shaking his head. We cannot camp here tonight, he said. We will go farther up. I didn't recall anywhere to camp farther up, and I was right. He stopped us about a thousand feet above the collapsing wall and had us carved sleeping platforms into the ice. It took hours, and it was exhausting work at that altitude, but I was happy to do it. Anything was better than sleeping under that wall. The next morning, the cold was back, which was not good because it lessened the chances of avalanches. Or, I'm sorry, it was good because it, it lessened the chances of avalanches. On the way to Camp 2, we heard over the radio that there were three climbing parties moving up to Camp 5. They were going to make a summit attempt the following day. Gulu was concerned because they had taken only one load of oxygen tanks to Camp 5. Zopa radioed Josh. I heard, Josh said. Idiots. None of them are fully acclimated. This is only their second time above Camp 4. As far as the, tank goes, the tanks go, some of them are going to try to get to the top without supplemental O's. So there should be enough for those who need it. If the weather holds, Sopa said. I talked to them about that, but their concern is that there won't be another good weather window. Nothing we can do about it. After they get to Camp 5, they're on their own. What he meant by this is that above Camp 5, there is little chance for rescue. 
The air is too thin for a helicopter, and at that altitude, everyone is too out of it to help anyone but themselves. If you die above Camp 5, your corpse stays there forever. Oh, Josh said, one more thing. Captain Sheck has been asking around about a Sherpa boy. Says he, think he came up, says he thinks he came up on the truck with you. Sunjo, Zopa said. He left a few days ago to go back to school. He just came up for the ride. I'll pass that on to the captain. This, this part of the conversation was obviously completely planned for Captain Sheck's benefit. The only problem now is that if the captain caught sight of Sunjo again, Zopa was going to be in trouble too. Everything else okay? Josh asked. Yes, we are all fine. I'll check in later. Zopa signed off and JR pointed his video camera at Zopa. Do you think those climbers will make it to the summit? Perhaps, Zopa said, but it's too early in the season. If they make it, others will try and some of them will die. There are no shortcuts on to the top of Sagarmatha. By the time we reached ABC the following afternoon, we were all exhausted, especially Sunjo, who was still feeling the effects of his recent illness. In a role reversal from our last time at ABC, I made dinner for us while he lay in his sleeping bag. I'd like to say that I felt sorry for him, but the truth is that I didn't. I was still resentful about his horning in on my climb. After we ate, I went outside and found the porters and Sher Sherpa sorting through the gear they were going to haul up to Camp 5. Zopa explained that the yaks could not go much past ABC. The Sherpas would carry the gear on their backs to Camps 4, 5, and 6 and establish camps a few days before we made our summit attempt. In the meantime, a couple of them would stay at ABC to guard our stuff. People would steal it, I said. It has happened, Zopa said. Not all expeditions are as well equipped or, as, or funded as your father's. Some climbers come to the mountain with nothing more than what they can carry, and sometimes they borrow equipment they find along the way. The next morning, he had his light in our packs, carrying only what we needed for a night at Camp 4, which was a good thing because three hours above ABC, we reached the foot of the col, which is basically a pass between two peaks. It was clear why the col was a dead end for the axe. The wall leading up, the, up to the path was enormous, and from the base it looked terrifyingly unstable. Half of the wall was smooth, rounded off by strong winds, giving it the look of soft ice cream. The other half was made out of nasty serex, or ice towers, that looked like giant, jagged teeth. If I'd had enough breath, the sight would have taken it away. If I, I looked at my altimeter watch. 7,000 meters, or 22,965 feet. Holly slogged up and rested her hands on her knees before looking up at the terrible wall. No way, she said. I agreed. Yogi and Yash walked up next, frowning and shaking their heads. Zopa and Sunjo arrived last. Zopa was carrying Sunjo's pack. Sunjo looked really bad. When he saw the wall, his face filled with dread. He almost felt sorry for him. Imagine what it was like two days ago when it was thawing, Zopa said. It was a good point. Three teams had made it up to the call in worse conditions like this. Then this. The first stage was the hardest. It was up a steep pitch of soft ice. Sherpas had cut steps into the ice, and they were fixed ropes, but the ice had was slick, and the ropes were still coated with ice because we were, up, we were the first up that day. We fell into an agonizing rhythm. Slide to the jamar up the rope. A jamar is a, is a mechanical ascender with a handle that slides up the rope and grabs on so you have something to hold on to as you pull yourself up. Step, breathe, jamar, step. Three hours later, it was more like jamar, think, look up, Think again, step, rest, 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 hug the wall, pray, as a chunk of ice the size of a hummer fell past, crashing below, followed by the sounds of our leaders, Yogi and Yash, laughing. Real funny. They were breaking away the loose ice along our route, so it wouldn't expected, unexpectedly peel us off the wall or knock our, our heads out of our butts, helmet and all. I was next in line, followed by the film crew, Holly, Sunjo, and Zopa. The, the climb was anything but quiet, with the brothers shouting, Ice! and Zopa shouting, Faster! Four hours after we started up, I reached the steepest pitch. Fifty feet. It might as well have been fifty miles. My arms and legs were numb and virtually useless, but the worst part was the air. There wasn't any. Or so it seemed. Each breath seemed to yield only a thimble full of precious oxygen. Maybe enough to keep a bird alive, but not enough for an exhausted fourteen-year-old climber. Dr. Wu had been wrong. There was something the matter with me. Yogi and Yash were already on top. One of them was manning the ropes, and I hoped the other one was boiling snow at Camp 4. 
We would all need a steaming cup of tea when we got there. If we got there. Holly, Sunjo, and Zopa had dropped farther behind, but I could still hear Zopa shouting at them to move faster. I was about ready to give up and head back down and go home when JR came up behind me. He looked terrible. His beard and goggles were covered with ice. It was a wonder he could see where he was going. Thanks for waiting, he rasped. I need to film you arriving. Give me a couple minutes head start to set the shot. I didn't have enough breath to tell him that I hadn't been waiting. I looked at my watch, and by the time I figured out what time it was, JR was already several feet above me. Without actually thinking about it, I started up behind him. An hour later, when I finally reached the top, Yogi hauled me over the edge by my backpack, which I was sure not which which I was sure was not the shot JR wanted. Yogi's assist reminded me that seven weeks ago to the day a cop had done the same thing to me on the top of the Woolworth building. I'd come a long way and I felt like it. I spent a good ten minutes on my knees trying to catch my breath until it dawned on me, again, that at this altitude there is no breath to catch. With difficulty, I got to my feet and stumbled over to where Yash was trying to boil water. Camp 4 was tiny, and to make it worse, there was a gapping crevasse running beneath the crest, which I'd read was getting wider every year. Some believed that one of these days, hopefully not today, the whole thing would collapse and climbers would have to devise a new route up the north side. I looked towards the summit, which was shrouded in gray mist, but I could see enough to pick out the route along the north ridge and across the north face to the pyramid. It seemed like a very long way from where Yash and I were squatting. I couldn't imagine the three climbing parties trying for the top feeling like I did. My ribs ached from trying to get enough O's into my lungs to survive. I knew that Zopa was carrying at least two tanks in case of emergency, and I suspected that Yogi and Yash had a couple of stashed as well. Sherpas do not climb without loads. For them, that would be a waste of effort. I thought about begging Yash for a hit off the tank, but I resisted the urge, knowing it would defeat the purpose of the climb. Instead, I started to put together my tent, which seemed a lot more complicated than it had at ABC the day before. Jack and Will came over the top next. Will spent a good ten minutes on his hands and knees puking. JR did not film this. Forty-five minutes later, I was still working on the tent when Yogi hauled Holly over the edge, followed by Sunjo and Zopa. Zopa was shaking his head in disgust, muttering, too slow, too slow, too slow. He bent down to the slew po- to the- he bent down to the two slow pokes. If you climb like that above here, you can forget the summit. Holly and Sunjo were out of it and didn't per- appear to have the slightest idea of what he was saying. I thought he was being pretty harsh considering Holly's lack of conditioning and Sunjo's recent sickness. He came over to where I was, struggling with the tent, and I thought, here it comes, but instead he patted me on the back. You did good, he said. You have a chance. That was like a whole tank of O's flowing into my bloodstream. Maybe he wasn't going to try to stop me from getting to the summit. Suddenly, the tent made complete sense. I had it together in less than five minutes. I got everything unpacked and the pads and sleeping bags spread out. Then I started in on Holly's tent and she, as she and Sunjo watched through dull, lifeless eyes. The burst of energy caught me. Cost me. As soon as I finished, it was all I could do to get to my feet. Zopa brought over three mugs of tea and made us drink them down. Get your stoves going, he said. I know you are not hungry, but you have to eat and drink. He looked up at the sky. It's going to snow tonight. Chapter 21. Arrest. Zopa, the weather monk, was right. Next morning, two feet from new snow. Sunjo and I didn't get three hours of sleep between us. He, w- he must have been feeling better, though, because he groggily offered to start the stove. The process sometimes takes 10 or 15 minutes because there isn't enough oxygen to keep the flame going on the gas lighter on the gas lighter long enough to light the stove. I crawled out with our pan to collect some snow to melt and saw Zopa, the Sherpa brothers, and the film crew were already up, and it was obvious from the stream coming off their pan of water that they had been up for quite a while. Zopa was talking on the radio. That could only mean one thing this early in the morning. Someone was in trouble. I glanced towards the summit through the swirling snow. If it was this bad down here, it was much worse up there. Yogi and Yash will stay here at Camp 4, Zopa was saying. If the weather breaks, they will try to get oxygen up to Camp 5. I'm not sure we can get them down to Camp 5, a shaky German accident voice said. You must, Zopa said forcefully. There is no chance of rescue at Camp 5 or 6. In this weather, you will have to come down to Camp 4. You must leave Camp 6 as soon as you can. Do you understand? This was followed by a long silence, then a discouraged and quiet. 
Yeah, he understood. Zopo gave him a quiet blessing in Nepalese and signed off. Are these the same Germans you did the puja ceremony for? I asked. Zopa nodded. The Italians are up there as well. What's going on? Two cases of hate at Camp 6, JR answered. Maybe another mild at camp, mild case at Camp 5. Two climbers headed up to the summit a little after midnight and haven't been heard of since. In this weather, that meant they were probably dead or hypothermic and close to death. Maybe we can go up to Camp 5 with Yogi and Yash and help, I said. Zopa shook his head. You and Sanjo and Miss Angelo need to get down to ABC. Our other Sherpas are other Sherpas are coming up to help, but until the climbers get to Camp 5, there's nothing anyone can do. As soon as you eat, pack your things. We need to leave before the weather worsens. Because of the snow and ice, getting down the call was worse than going up, and it didn't make it easy and it wasn't made any easier by thinking about the climbers dying farther up the mountain. We passed the Sherpas coming up to help. They were loaded with oxygen bottles and gamoth bags. Their plan was to get to Camp 4 that afternoon. If the weather didn't hold them back, they would head up the mountain the following morning to help Yogi and Yash get whoever had made it to Camp 5 down to Camp 4. If the weather broke, a rescue helicopter might be able to get that high, but even on the best day, an airlift was dicey. If the chopper couldn't make it, the Sherpas would have to get the climbers down to ABC as best they could. We made it down to ABC in pretty good time in spite of the snow. I think what drove us was our eagerness to crawl into our tents and sleep for two days. The camp was nearly empty. Sanjo was still pretty weak, but confident that he would be better by the time we came up. I was beginning to feel a little less surely towards him. This probably had a lot to do with Zopa's compliment the night before. I was pretty sure they weren't out to sabotage my climb. The next morning, the film crew members were all vomiting. It looked like they had caught the same thing Sanjo had. Zopa cut their acclimatization short and arranged to have them go down to base camp with another climbing party. None of them complained. I'm going too, Holly said. Zopa shook his head. You are fine. To complete the acclimatization, you will need to stay here for at least two days. She gave him a smile. It's over for me, she said. I have no desire to go higher than Camp 4. You can make it to the summit, Zopa insisted. She shook her head and grinned. Too slow. It's not in it me. It's not in me this year. I appreciate all you've done. She shook his hand, then turned to me. What about that interview after you get to the summit? I may not make it to the summit, I hedged. I think you will. She looked at Sanjo. How about you? Will you give me an exclusive interview after you come down? Yes. I thought he was being overly optimistic, but I didn't say anything. It's a deal and your grandfather is our witness, Holly said. It means you can't talk to any other print journalist until after you talk to me. Call you in New York City? Yes, she wrote down several numbers. Don't lose them. Before she left, she gave me a hug. I didn't mind this time. In fact, I was going to miss her, which surprised me. If you ever get back to New York Peak, you'd better call. I will. As they headed down, JR stopped and shouted back for me to remember to use the camera. Just before, du just before dark, five climbers, two Germans, three Italians, and their Sherpas stumbled into ABC looking like they had been bur buried alive. Most of them had frostbite someplace on their bodies. Fingers, toes, ears, noses. One of them had snow blindness and had been led into camp by a rope tied around his waist. There was no doctor in camp, so Zopa and Gulu, who had stayed behind with his yak so he could sneak Sanjo back into base camp, did their best treating their injuries. When they finished, it was clear that the three of the climbers were not going to make it down to base camp on their own. The other two German climbers who had hape were not going to make it down at all. They had died at Camp 6 two hours after Zopa talked to the distraught German climber the previous day. Four dead, assuming the two climbers headed to the summit didn't make it, which was a pretty good assumption at that point. It's hard to think straight at that altitude, but I had enough feeling in my oxygen-starved brain to feel a little shame over the way I had been thinking about Sunjo. Climbing Everest is not a competition. It's life and death. The surviving climbers at Camp 6 headed down to Camp 5. Yogi and Yash were helping them haul the climber with mild hape to Camp 4. Those who, could would, those who could would have to make their way to ABC the following day. Zopa radioed Josh and told him what was going on. We have a chopper here with a Chinese pilot willing to take a risk, Josh said, but the weather is going to have to get a lot better up there before he can give it a shot. Do you think it might clear before dark? Zopa did not have to look. Visibility was down to about 20 feet. Negative, he answered. Then we'll have to wait until tomorrow. 
Any idea when the climbers from Camp 4 will make it down to ABC? No, but we will go up to meet them. Early afternoon, I hope. The chopper's small, Josh said. It will only hold four people aside from the pilot and Captain Sheck. You'll have to choose who gets a ride and who's going, who goes down on their own two feet. Captain Sheck is coming up? That's what I hear. He's still looking for that kid. Why? The boy left. He's certainly not up here. I told Sheck that, but apparently he doesn't believe it. He searched the border camp yesterday, and today he has soldiers checking everyone coming into base camp. I guess he can do what he wants, Sopa said, but I could see he was worried. So was Sunjo. I wasn't sure how they were going to get him back down to the porter camp. Gulu's yak had, e had eaten its hay, so there was nothing for Sunjo to hide under. Captain Sheck checking climbers was not good news, nor was his search of the porter camp. We have a lot of injured climbers up here, Zopa continued. We could use the room in that helicopter. I know, Josh said. I'll talk to Captain Sheck again. Maybe he'll realize that taking up an empty seat might be the death of a climber, and the death would be his fault. It was true, but the conversation was entirely for Captain Sheck's benefit, who was no doubt eavesdropping. I hope so, Zopa said, then changed the subject. Did, the, did Miss Angelo and the film crew get down? They just arrived. Holly's packing her gear. There's a truck leaving tomorrow. To tell you the truth, she made it farther up the mountain than I expected. Doc's taking a look at the film crew right now. They barely made it into camp. Almost everybody has the virus down here. Leah's going crazy treating everyone. The chopper brought in more antibiotics. Five more climbing parties pulled up stakes this morning and left the mountain, sick as dogs. I think I'm getting it too. If it keeps up, no one is getting to the summit from this side. I hoped that what I had gotten over was the same virus everyone else was getting now, and that I wouldn't get it again. I'd have to be careful when I got back down. I wasn't about to have a virus wreck my chances of getting to the summit. Early the next morning, Zopa sent everyone down to base camp except for the climber with snow blindness and the man with frostbitten feet. Sanjo and Gulu went with them. Sanjo couldn't, stay, couldn't very well stay at ABC with Captain Shek coming up. I didn't ask how they were going to get him to the porter camp, but I guess they would get, keep him at one of the camps between ABC and base camp until Captain Sheck gave up. Zopa asked if I wanted to go too. I did, but I told him I'd stay and help him with the climbers going down from Camp 4. The weather had broken during the night. It was still cold, but the clouds had thinned and the wind had died down some. The climber with mild hape had gotten worse during the night and they put him in a bag. This meant they would not be able to bring him down the treacherous ice wall. The chopper would have to rescue him at Camp 4. Our job was to help Yogi and Yash get the remaining climbers and Sherpas down to ABC as quickly as possible. If some of them needed to be flown to base camp, they had to be ready to go when the chopper landed at ABC. There would only be one flight. We traveled light and got to the base of the call just as Yogi was coming down. He said that Yash, Yash was staying with the injured climbers at Camp 4. How many? Zopa asked. Three. Two with bad frostbite and one with hape. He looked up. Some of those coming down could also use a ride to base camp. There were six climbers altogether, exhausted but happy to get off the wall. Zopa offered them bit bits of oxygen, which most of them greatly took. Gratefully took, I mean. No point in acclimatization now. After they got to base camp, they would be going home. A half hour outside ABC, the chopper flew over us on its way to Camp 4. Zopi hurried everyone along. Zopa hurried everyone along, thinking the pilot would not stay long after he landed at ABC. It turned out the stay was longer than expected. The chopper landed ten minutes after we arrived. Zopa picked up two of the most. Zopa picked two of the most debilitated climbers for the ride down, and one backup in case Captain Sheck had listened to reason and stayed at base camp. He hadn't. He stepped through the mini, the mini blizzard caused by the rotors, wearing a full uniform including a pistol. The pilot followed behind him and looked as unhappy as all of us did. Helicopters aren't designed to fly at that altitude. If the weather got worse, it wouldn't be able to fly. Captain Sheck didn't appear to be any in any hurry at all. He casually walked over to the mess tent and looked inside, then smelled the pot of stew simmering on the gas stove like he was, like he was some kind of gourmet. I will see everybody papers, he said. He had to be kidding. It was one thing to check everyone coming off the mountain, but to do it at 21,161 feet with injured climbers waiting to be evacuated was outrageous. Several of the climbers let out a howl of protest despite the thin air and their condition. Why would we have our bloody papers up here? 
This is an emergency. We need to get the injured to base camp. Are you crazy? Captain Sheck seemed a little shocked at the response and changed his tact. We, we search camp before we leave, he said, causing another vocal outburst, which he ignored. He and, pilot, he and the pilot went through all the tents, although the pilot was clearly not happy about the duty. When they finished, Captain Sheck said, We looking for boy. Not Everyone looked at me. Not that boy. Nepal boy. Same age. He went back home over a week ago, Zopa said. Captain Sheck shook his head. I don't think. He pointed at the chopper. You come with me. We have injured climbers, Zopa said mildly. I'll check in with you when I get to base camp tomorrow. No, Sheck said. You come with me now. I arrest you. One of the German climbers took a step toward the captain. He was the team leader who had talked to us from Camp 6. His name was his name was Dietrich. His face was bright red and it wasn't from the cold. He began shouting shouting in German, which I didn't understand. I don't think Captain Sheck understood either, but he put his hand on his pistol. Zopa stepped in front of Dietrich and said something to him in German, then turned to the pilot and asked something in Chinese. The pilot thought about it for a moment, then answered. He thinks he can take four climbers, Zopa said. There were two additional climbers who could have used a ride, but Dietrich relaxed a little and gave a terse nod. What about you? I asked Zopa. Zopa shrugged. It's just a misunderstanding. He and I knew it was more than that. The question was, how much did Captain Sheck know? I'll radio Josh and tell him what's going on. Be careful going down, Zopa said. You'll have to leave early and go slow. Ask Josh to send some Sherpas up to meet you in case I'm detained longer than I expect. Ten minutes later, they took off. I radioed Josh and told him about Zopa's arrest. Sheck's a maniac, he shouted. The Sherpas and porters down here are going to go nuts when they find out. I wondered if Captain Sheck's men would pass this on to him. I suspected they would. I also suspected that's exactly why Josh said it. That's the end of chapter 21. Um, we'll continue with chapter 22 in the next video.